Moving on to today's study, we are uh, going to look at Judges chapter 16. And with chapter 16, we will come to the close of our study of Samson as the last of the judges that is listed in, in this book. And uh, before we move into chapter 16, let's just do a quick recap of what we studied about Samson uh, from chapters 13 to 14. We saw in chapter 13, the context, the situation in which this period of time is set is a time when Israel was dominated by the Philistines. But we saw something different, which was this time, unlike earlier when they were dominated by the various Canaanites and Midianites, the Israelites seemed to be contented. They did not cry out to the Lord for deliverance. But we saw still God was putting together a plan of redemption. And this was independent of any repentance from the part of Israel. We also saw in chapter 14 and 15 that God's plan of deliverance, uh, rather starting from chapter 13 itself, that God's plan of deliverance is a long-term plan. In this case, it started with Samson, and Samson was selected and chosen right from his conception. And this deliverance would extend into generations. It was a long plan. Samson was the beginning. For a person to be used as a deliverer, we saw that Samson had to be a Nazarite, and a Nazarite meant being set apart, holy, right? And it requires, and for Samson to become a Nazarite, it required the participation of his family. It started, Samson was a Nazarite right from his conception. His mother also had to be part of the vows. His family had to raise him as a Nazarite. And we saw all of that happening. Yet, in chapter 14 and 15, we saw Samson indulging himself. He broke all his vows, Nazarite vows, except perhaps the one which was to do with cutting of his hair. And the last straw, he cuts that also in this chapter. Yet, and, and through, yet through all of Samson's weaknesses, we saw God acting. And we were told that God knew what was happening and he was in control in chapter four. Uh, in chapter 14, verse four, we were told that God was permitting this to happen because it was part of his plan, right? Through this, we saw that God is not justifying sin. He was not justifying Samson's deeds, but he was continuously repurposing the effect of Samson's weaknesses and sins to meet his purpose. And in last chapter, we saw something interesting happening that God we saw was continuously prompting and speaking to Samson. So much so that Samson begins to recognize God's role in his life and his mission. We saw for the first time, Samson last time, when he was bound by the Judahites and brought down to the Philistines, he, he appeals to God after he kills his thousand Philistines. He appeals to God to slake his thirst. He says like, I'm thirsty, right? And he recognizes, one, it is God who provided him the victory, that God is the one, the source of all his exploits, and that he had a further mission. His life did not end here. He had more to do in God's sight. And so we saw him appealing to God last time. And that was a first, right? So that's where we ended last time. Going into chapter 16, that is today's study, First thing to note is chapter 16 is sandwiched between two references to Gaza, right? In chapter 15, verse 20, the closing sentences, Samson, I'm sorry, it is sandwiched in a period of 20 years. So chapter 15, verse 20 says, Samson led Israel for 20 years, right? And then chapter 16 ends I'm sorry, I'll read chapter 15, verse 20. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. And it ends, chapter 7, 16, verse 30, specs. Verse 31 ends with, he led, he had led Israel 20 years. So all of what we're reading today, chapter 16, is set in this period of 20 years when Samson led Israel. So he was their judge. Interestingly, there is no reference of Israel having peace and rest during this time. It is, if you read chapter 15, verse 20, it says, he led Israel in the days of the Philistines. So there is still no reference of disharmony between the 
Israelites and the Philistines. They seem to be pretty settled. But we know, we have already been told that God is going to disrupt this equation, right? So <clears throat> two things to note in the two sentences which sandwich this chapter. There is no mention of rest for Israel. But what has been mentioned, what is absent is rest for Israel. What is present is the Philistines had prominence. Then second is, through this chapter we will notice, what is absent is there is no other Israel working with Samson. What is present is, again, the absence of the larger participation by Israel. Because when Samson dies at the end of this chapter, we see that he's buried by his brothers and his family. There is no mention of Israel mourning for him or Israel at large participating for him or even his tribe. Okay. So that's what stands out in this chapter. One is the period. The second is the fact that he is operating alone, largely. There are three major themes or thought lines that we can take while we study today's chapter. One is, the first, one is we can focus on Samson's activities. But I think the message that we have to take out is more to do with what's behind this, right? So to do that, the first section is the section where he goes to this prostitute in Gaza. What stands out there is the fact that Gaza loses its gates. And the question we have to ask is why is there so much of prominence to the fact that Samson pulls out the gates of Gaza? So he goes to Gaza. Gaza is a very far away city from his whole town. It's around 40 or was it 60 miles? It's on the coast. So coastal cities typically are uh, hubs of commerce. There's a lot of activity going on there. And it's uh, it's it's a place to have fun and there's a lot of, it's a happening place, right? So we see Samson visiting here. We already know about Samson's weaknesses, right? We have explicit instance of weaknesses with women and we have hints that he was weak in the case of wine, two of his Nazarite verbs, right? So Samson's going far away and he visits, we are told he visits a prostitute. We are told that there's a lookout notice for Samson, right? People, the Philistines are looking out for him. So much so that as soon as it is noticed by somebody that he has entered Gaza and gone to visit this prostitute, people are alerted. The Philistines are alerted and they decide to lay a trap for him. Right? Yet in that portion, most of that passage is the prominent feature is the fact that Samson lifts the gates and takes it out. So the question is why? Second, there's a large portion of this chapter that is given to how Delilah betrays Samson. Right? She is offered money, which she gladly accepts. There is no threat on her life this time. And she is betraying him. She's continuously trying to get from him the answer, the source of the secret of his strength. And in the end, Samson reveals what he thinks is the secret of his success. And we know that whatever that was, we know that the Philistines are able to prevail over Samson. The question is, what was the real reason why his strength disappeared? Was it what Samson thought or was it something else? Uh, so we'll read carefully and try to understand the answer to that question. The third question, the third thought line is, we see Samson humbled, right, this time. Till now, he's never been humbled. He is defiant. He has been bought down. He, has, he agrees to be subdued by the Judites and bought down, but he is never humbled. Here we see Samson is humbled, and yet he finds the strength to bring down the pillars that supported the temple of Dagon. That's his last hurrah. And if you read the Hebrew, the pillars of the temple of Dagon in Hebrew it's written as the pillars upon whose of Dagon, that is the god of the Philistines, was founded. So in this moment of humbleness, when he's been humbled and brought down to the earth when he finds the strength to pull down the pillars on which the house of Dagon was founded. So what does this imply? That's the third thought. Line. We'll take a quick look at Samson's life in itself, right? Samson, uh, we are told, there's a book written uh, about Samson called the Samson Syndrome, where the author tries to highlight 12 tendencies that people have, have uh, tend to uh, acquire. And he calls him the Samson syndrome, weaknesses in our character, which we have to work on. Okay. 
and we see as the conclusion of this chapter with faith we can overcome the samson syndrome right even though we are subject though we are we can become victims of the samson syndrome all the aspects through which we can fail with faith we shall gain strength in weakness because when we see samson he is listed as an exemplar of faith in the new testament hebrews 11 and we see that the one phrase sub phrase that tells us why probably samson is in those in that list is with faith he gained strength in weakness so that's what we will look at in this chapter so having set that context and that's a quick overview of what we will look at in this chapter let's move to our first question it comes from the first three verses focusing on samson removing the gates of gaza so samson does not choose just to escape from the philistines waiting to kill him at gaza what message can we get from his action of carrying away the gates okay and what do you think samson why do you think samson did this he was trying to give a message to the philistines and what is this message what is the message the, that samson was giving the philistines when he carried away their gates okay so the other thing to observe is chapter 16 is very gaza focused so it starts and ends with gaza he visits his prostitute in gaza which is what we are looking on and samson's end is in the temple of dagon in gaza gaza is a very important fortified city for the philistines the philistines ruled over five big cities and the gaza was the most important and fortified city remember another fortified city in judges chapter 2 jericho which was the first target that the canaanites that israel had to attack and overcome when they had to occupy canaan remember samson is also the first the beginning of god's deliverance against the philistines so look for parallels between gaza and what was the message that samson was trying to convey to the philistines through his actions that's our first question the reference is joshua 2 oh my mistake yes it is joshua 2 not judges 2 sorry the jericho reference um so what can we gather from chapter 16 we know that Sam- gaza is a long way away from home so Sa- Sa- samson is straying very far away now we know that he is a wanted man because somebody notices him and alerts the philistines we know that gaza the word gaza means the stronghold is probably the best fortified important city even from their traditions and from their religion perspective gaza so from that context when you look at jericho we know that jericho was there's there's a lot of space given to the describing the walls of jericho right to those huge walls and how they had to come down and we know that jericho was the first city that they had to overcome it was the threshold it was the opening into the sit into canaan and that was the first and probably the best fortified city that israel had to overcome to face the rest of canaan we know that this literal parallels that joshua spies were sheltered by rahab the prostitutes the spies were being hunted uh, they the jet the canaanites knew that the spies had come and they were hunting for them similarly in the case of samson also jericho's walls were huge and they came down miraculously symbolically we can imagine god's finger writing a message on the walls of canaan and also in this case in the walls of gaza the like remember the story of daniel when uh, the king sees his finger writing on the wall mene mene tekel parsin mene stands for the days of your kingdom are numbered and brought to an end tekel you have been weighed and found wanting pere your kingdom will be divided and given by god to his choice of inheritors i think daniel is you could transplant that that story from daniel into both jericho and gaza it's god's finger writing on the walls of gaza in this portion saying your you have been found wanting and your kingdom is going to be divided and samson is delivering the message to gaza at this time we know that samson had a weakness for women right so given the first three 
depends on the gates of Gaza. Let's just read verse 2. In verse 2, we are told a lot of stuff. We are told that the Philistines had popular support in Gaza. They were alerted. They surrounded the city. They laid an ambush at the city gates. Surely, when they surrounded the city and laid an ambush in the night, they would have had some rotational night watchmen so that some could sleep and the others could stay alert. They were well armed because we know that they intended to kill him. And what would we expect in a story? How would we have expected the story to proceed? We would have expected to hear how Samson escaped from the prostitute's house in the dead of the night. Perhaps she would have helped him and alerted him. How he killed the sentries, probably because they were sleepy, because they were not alert. And how he slips over the wall of Gaza, probably with the help of the prostitute, like how Rahab helped the spies, and how he escapes. Instead, verse 3 gives us a surprise ending. There's a twist in the tale. We are told nothing about the opposition that we are drawn attention to in verse 2. But we are told everything about the gates of Gaza. Because what did the gates represent? It represented the solidity. The walls and the gates of the city represented the solidity. It was a visible message of strength and power of what is inside. So whoever resides in Gaza, the way they projected their power and their strength is in the size of their gates, the size of their battlements, the thickness of the gates and the size the, the height of the walls. Okay? So we see all of this, yet verse 13 only focuses on the fact that Samson uprooted totally the gates, carried them away by a superhuman effort, and placed them on a hill some distance away. So in doing this, Samson was mocking the Philistines, like you all noticed. He was using the facade, that is the outer appearance, the gates, the wall, the gates, to mock the substance of what was within. What was within the city were the builders of the city and the residents of the city. He was using the external facade, the door, and to mock the people who were inside. We know that not all of Samson's action had God's sanction, but we know that God had sown the seeds of rebellion against Philistines in Samson's heart. Right from the start, we were told that. So when Samson was acting this way, he was, um, he was acting on impulses that God had sown in his heart. Okay, So that's the thing. So Samson is out there in their face and he's telling them that your gates can't hold me. Right? With that, we move on to the second question. This is a longer portion. We see this is the portion that narrates how Delilah three times tries to make Samson reveal the secret of his strength. And she's unsuccessful in all the times. After his earlier experience with the Philistine girl at Timna, remember the girl he saw, told his parents he wanted to marry, and that wedding feast, the party, where he had this riddle about the lion and the honey. And we know that he concluded that his fiance had betrayed him. So he knew he, to an extent, should have learned from his mistakes, right? Why is Samson again in a similar situation with Delilah again? Quite a similar situation. So he's fallen into the hold of a woman uh, whom he's lusting after and she is trying to extract on behalf of her people the some something from Samson to fatally uh, attack him. Why is this happening to Samson again and again? What are your thoughts? Okay, I think so we'll just go on. So let's just dig in a little. What do we already know? We know that Samson had a weakness for women and possibly for wine. At Timna, we see that he's lusted, but he tried to legitimize the source of his lust, right? He wanted to marry this girl. At Gaza, we see his body betrayed him. He lusted and he took with no, not even an attempt at legitimacy. So he goes to this prostitute and just uh, satisfies his needs. Um, though it doesn't say that explicitly, but we can assume that's why he went to the prostitute. With Delilah, there is a difference. One is, if you have noticed, Delilah is the only woman that is named in, in all of the Samson episode. His mother remains Manoah's wife. The girl at Timna remains the girl at Timna. And we have an unnamed prostitute. Delilah is named, so we are to focus on her. She is she is supposed to be remembered, right? With Delilah, Samson's relationship is different. 
she's the hooks that she puts into Samson goes deeper than any of the other times. We are told in verse four that Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah. So this time his heart is involved. And like his eyes and his body, his heart also betrays him. He does not try to legitimize. It's the relationship he has with Delilah is like a living relationship. We don't see that the, any disapproval from the Philistines. Say, perhaps that was something that happened in those days too. So we see that progression from eye to body to heart. Um, in all of these cases, Samson's body is betraying him. Is Samson aware of the danger of trusting Delilah? We see that he's flirting with the truth, right? And all the responses he gives, they're very symbolic. In some way, they're symbolically significant enough for Delilah to think that this might be the real answer. When he talks about seven cords, seven is an important number in the Eastern tradition and for the Israelites. When he talked about unused ropes, she might have known about the unused, uh, the fresh cords that the Judah people used to bind Samson. We were called attention to the fact that the Judahites bound him with fresh uh, ropes and brought him down. So she, the fact that they use fresh ropes might mean something. And so when Samson tells her, you bind me with fresh um, with fresh ropes, she might have seen some symbolic significance in that. Again, the seven motive, when he talks about his hair, so his hair is very visibly long, and she talk, he tells her about the seven braids of his hair that had to be woven into the cloth in the loom. So in all cases, we see him flirting with the truth. He's, he's, he's balancing, he's walking on the edge. And all the answers he gives is not just a blatant red herring, but there is some element of truth enough to give Delilah the feeling that she may be getting there. So, so we see that Samson, and every time he responds, when Delilah tells him, right, when she does what he says is the secret of his strength, uh, how to overcome the secret of his strength, we see that he wakes up in alarm and he shakes, shakes it off. So he's aware that he's in Philistine territory. But he's so confident, even after three times, he's so confident in his own strength to the point of arrogance. Like somebody had observed, he thinks he's in control. So what can he get from Samson in, this, in these three cases? We see Samson's moral compromises makes him vulnerable to all his other weaknesses. The very fact that he is morally compromised, now with, it kind of accentuates, it, it amplifies all the other weaknesses he has, like ego, arrogance, loose talk, thinking that he's smart, that he can get away with just some riddles and reveal part answers and get away with it. So every other weakness gets amplified when moral weaknesses exist in a person. And that we see through Samson also, right? So that's, the, I think, the key thing that we can take out of the first three tests that uh, Delilah tries to get the secret from him. With that, let's move to the next question, which is, we see in the last attempt that Delilah makes, Samson ends up betraying himself. Delilah is persistent. And she seems to have a stronghold. She's blackmailing him emotionally, right? She's claiming, we know that he's in love and he's using the fact that she's, he's in love with her against him. She says, how can you say that you're in love with me, right? How can you say this, I love you, when you won't confide in me? So she extracts the secret. She uses that as a weapon to extract the secret from of Samson's strength. Why did Samson, what is the secret that Samson reveals this time? And why did his strength really fail him this time? So was it that secret that he revealed? Just remember that in Judges, so why did Samson think that was a secret? Remember in chapter 13, verse 2 to 5, how the angel of the Lord had told. It's, it's interesting to read that portion. I'll just read that. Chapter 13, verse 2 to 5. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who's, who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are sterile and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. 
Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor must be used on his head because the boy is a Nazarite set apart to God from birth. Okay. There is no, it is the sign of his uncut hair was a visible sign that he was set apart. Right. There is nothing here that says that because of that, he's going to be endowed with superhuman strength. Right. But just remember this when we think about this question. So the question again, why did Samson's strength fail him this time? The last attempt in verse 15 to 22. And what was the secret? What did Samson think was the secret? But what was really the secret of his failure? Ooh. Yeah, it also begs the question, right, for us. What, what do we perceive as a source of our strength? Very true. So when we get into this portion, the first question is, what do we know about the Philistines and Delilah to set up the context? In verse 5, we know that the Philistines had an unsolved mystery to deal with. What makes Samson so strong? Verse 5, they go to Delilah and tell, ask her, the rulers of the Philistines went down to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overcome him. Okay, so this time this canvas is really big. It has widened out. We have the whole Philistines, the five, the rulers of the five Philistine cities going to Delilah and they have this big question. They have seen demonstration of Samson's strength Perhaps Samson's build was not proportional to his demonstrated supernatural strength. And that is why they knew there had to be a secret. There was something, quote unquote, supernatural. And they wanted Delilah to figure that out for them. Right? We see that Delilah has no love, no loyalty. At least the girl in Timna, who was supposed to be his fiance, had fear. They used fear as a weapon against her. They told her that they would set burn down her and her family. But in Delilah's case, she betrays him for a price, not out of fear. She knows also, it is not that she thought that they would just take Samson away or something like that. She knew that they intended to kill him because they said that explicitly. So we see in Delilah someone who has no loyalty, no love. She's willing to use all that is at her disposal. Her attractiveness, her ability to uh, play on Samson, Samson's emotions and heart to for money, right? Next question is, what did Samson think was the secret of his success? From verse 17, Samson told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. Samson knows that his uncut hair is a visible sign of him being a Nazarite. And he also knows to be a Nazarite is to be set apart for God. Samson, we know, recognizes himself that his strength was supernatural and it was from God. Right? We saw him confessing to that in the last chapter also. But what Samson does not know that it is the empowering of the Holy Spirit every time, right? He thinks that the strength that God is giving him is channeled by God through his hair. And, and, the only, that, and that's the only secret, that's the only Nazarite vow that he has not broken, that he has kept unbroken. So we know that he is priding himself on his strength and his valor and his acts of uh, strength. And his hair is the only uncut thing. That's the only Nazarite vow he has not unbroken. So from this verse, we can infer, I think it is okay for us to infer, that he thinks that his strength is channeled by God, but through his hair. Okay? So he's got it wrong. But I think that we can make that inference safely. Moving on to verse 20, when Samson woke up after Delilah had she put him to sleep. So she probably drugged him in some way and made sure that he was fast asleep and got his head shaved. And when he woke up, he thought, I will do as I did before and shake myself free. But he did not realize, I'm emphasizing the words there, that the Lord had left him. For Samson, his hair was a symbol of his dedication to the Lord. But Samson's real dedication to the Lord was weak. 
it was just his dedication to the lord was just as strong as his hair was right so though he revealed a sick he uh, yet revealing a secret knowledge though it was not perfect was a so though he revealed this fact that he was set apart and that his heart hair was a symbol of his set apartness to god he had that knowledge that he was a nazarite and that god was endowing him but we know that his knowledge of his strength was not perfect right but he was willing to trade that knowledge and that was the final act of betrayal of samson to god right he was willing to trade the secret of his set apartness to possess the object of his love and with that we read that god's spirit left him in the old testament whenever god's spirit is said to depart from someone the results were always disastrous when we get to samuel we'll read about saul right in first samuel 16:14 after david is anointed by samuel we are we are told that the spirit of the lord turned away from saul and with that an evil spirit from the lord tormented him in psalm 51:11 this is after david's uh, affair with bathsheba and when he ends up uh, doing all those wrong things when he ends up killing uh, bathsheba's husband I, uh, all of that and when he's confronted by uh, nathan we see psalm 51 is a psalm that he writes after he realizes what he has done and in in that psalm david appeals to god he says do not reject me o lord do not take your holy spirit away from me david sees the taking away of the holy spirit from him is a sign of god's rejection so samson here god is temporarily rejecting samson right and it's it's a very significant thing to be told that the lord had left him so god has chosen to humble samson but we will read the chapter doesn't end the story doesn't end there we will read that through this brokenness when god breaks him through his brokenness god would do his mightiest acts through samson that leads us to the next question which is samson's final victory so samson's final act of strength in bringing down the temple comes at his weakest physical physically weakest moment what can we learn now about the source of samson's strength do you think that this might have been his greatest achievement against the philistines and why so let's move on so what was samson's state now in this portion we see that he had graduated from a sort of spiritual blindness to physical blindness route now after he was uh, caught by the philistines they gouged out his eyes we are told his ego was crushed right everything that samson took pride in had been taken away from him he was now in prison he was in chains all of this is from verse 21 25 to 26 he was relegated to the task of grinding in the prison and grinding is typically a woman's task right so even the task he was given was something which was not with honor in prison he was an object and a source of entertainment for the people and visibly he was a shell of his old strength and why do i say that because we read in verse 26 that he was led about by a young man they did not even need a strong soldier to lead him about just a young man could lead him around so he was a shell of his former self it gives us a good picture of where samson was now right but even in this moment even in the darkest prison there's a spark of hope because in verse 22 we are told samson's hair began to grow back after he had shaved off but we decided last time that samson's hair was not the source of his strength it was symbolic of something right so what does it symbolize his returning strength did it symbolize that his strength was returning or that sparks of renewed commitment to god was happening in his heart i think we know already we settled the question uh, the last time in the last question we settled it that his hair was not the source of his strength so when the bible tells us in verse 22 that his hair began to grow back i think it is a hint to us that god's spirit was rekindling within samson a faith in his brokenness god was rekindling his faith and going to light it up 
Is there evidence of that? Yes. Because in verse 28, Samson seeks strength now from the Lord. And he acknowledges God as, O oh, sovereign Lord. I mean, it's total submission. Remember me. Strengthen me just one more time. A question. He's asking him to strengthen him so that he could take revenge for losing his two eyes. So was it justified? So when you see these Hindu, Christian, Muslim debates, very often you'll see this challenge thrown at the Christians that even the Christians are terrorists, read the Old Testament, take Samson, he killed 3,000 innocent men and women. He was a suicide bomber. He is the equivalent of today's human bomb, suicide bomber. So was Samson on a suicide mission? Or was he a terrorist? That's a question, right? In Hebrew, so let's dig a little deeper. Let's look at the text and see what the text is trying to tell us also. In Hebrew, the two pillars that supported the temple, that's how we read it in the English version. In Hebrew, the word is, it denotes the pillars upon which the house of Dagon was founded. It was not just standing, it was founded. So Samson was pushing against the very foundation of the house of Dagon. And what came down was the foundation of Dagon's house, the temple to the other gods. What was being eliminated symbolically here was the worship of other gods by the Philistines. So both Samson's greatest act here was to recognize his brokenness and allow God finally to take total control. And through him, he became an instrument. He was a willing instrument for God to strike a blow against the worship of other gods. That's where this portion ends. Because we know that's what all of uh, Judges is about. is about Israel failing to be loyal to God and lusting after other gods, falling away in their worship. And then being suppressed and then being delivered and then again falling away into apostasy. So that's, that's the final thing that Samson achieves here, right? There's a decisive, decisive blow that God strikes through him against the temple of Dagon and against the worshippers of other gods. So Samson's example of faith was that, so in Hebrews 11, which is that uh, great hall of fame of faith warriors in the Old Testament, Samson is listed there. And why was he listed as an exemplar of faith? There is a part of that that explains why these people were called out as great faith warriors. And there is a phrase there, a sub phrase which says, one, they gain strength in their weakness. And I think that talks about Samson because we see Samson here gain strength. It is in his weakest moment that he got his greatest strength and where he was able to be used as the greatest instrument by God. So with that, we come to the end of that portion. There are some aspects which I have left out. I've just tried to focus our attention on some of the things that, uh, that we can dig out from a little lower level. Okay. So I mentioned this book that was written called The Samson Syndrome, where the author lists out 12 tendencies of people, especially people who perceive themselves as strong. First one is a disregard for boundaries. Since I'll be sharing these notes, I won't go through all of them. I'm just setting up a context for our last question. There are a lot of things. We recognize all of this in Samson, these 12 things, right? And perhaps when you look into our hearts, we'll recognize this in us also. Just picking on the first one, disregard for boundaries, leads us to our last question. The first tendency of the Samson syndrome was disregard for boundaries. Now, this is an important warning for us, both as individuals and as parents, right? How do we know? One is to establish and model as parents boundaries for in life for our children. We must know what the boundaries are. So how do we know what the boundaries are first? And how do we establish or model the boundaries for our children as parents? Right? So that's our last question for the breakout. And it's, it's again a little open-ended. Um, so we can feel free to discuss. There, is, uh, there are a lot of answers and whatever you can share as thoughts within your groups. When you come back, if you have some observation that you think will stand out for all of us, please do share that. Okay. So I will uh, share this breakout question and Minnie will break us out into groups. So coming to our question, some, 
some questions, right? Some interesting questions are, um, while we were in our discussion room, I was thinking, so did Manoa's parents fail in, in not raising him up? We know that Samson was blowing through his boundaries, right? So the question was, did his parents fail? We know that they tried to correct him. And we know that he blew through the boundaries. So in our group, um, some of the discussions were, and uh, Rinsi had brought up a good point, which is that when you raise your children, uh, when you correct them, when you teach them, it will stay in their hearts sometime. It's right. And it just recalls Proverbs when it says that, um, teach your children the way they must go and they will remember it, right? I forgot the exact wording. If anyone can say it for me. Uh, okay, let's, it's a very familiar proverb that everyone knows of. Mm -hmm. right? I just forgot the exact uh, wording. But um, first thing, let's, let's just take an example, okay? Imagine as parents, you go to your, your, you have a kid who is still in school, say primary school, and you're going there, and it's sports day. There's a game. None of you know how to play football, soccer. And there is a game between the students in the class, and your child is also there. One, there is no referee. So the PT master tells you, you be the referee. And he forces you to be the referee. So here you are in a situation. You do not know anyone except your kid. You do not know the rules of the game. Can you think of the state of the game? All mm -hmm. sorts of havoc is going to happen, right? You don't even have a whistle away to signal to them. So when you do not know the rules and when you do not know how you can establish order, the game is going to disintegrate into chaos. So you do need rules. You need boundaries, right? What are boundaries after all? Boundaries are... Uh, Boundaries are something that protect us. That's a fence between the signposts of love. You need posts between which you put up the fence that serves as a boundary. And you string up this fence that constitutes a boundary between signposts of love. A boundary is always an indication of love. How do you put up the boundaries? In Proverbs 7, 1 to 15, there are a lot, lot of things that I bought out there. Jeremiah also has a promise. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He writes God's laws on our hearts and gives us the ability to keep them. So how does God write that? You may be a part of that as a parent of writing God's laws on the heart, engraving it on the hearts of your children. Your children may depart from it for a period of time, but there are many, many stories we know from our own circumstances around a child at some time, right? Like Samson, at moments of weakness, when he was thirsty and when he was think his parents also had a role to play there in inscribing that on the tablet of his heart. Luke has some advice that we can follow. It's very indirect, but I think we can take, if you take the introduction, so Luke is the, he is a physician. He's a, a very good author, right? In the New Testament, he wrote both uh, the gospel according to Luke as well as Acts. And his preface to his gospel in, in, in the gospel according to Luke, he has some good advice for us. He says that he made careful investigation of the accounts. So how do we make a careful investigation of the accounts, of the basis of faith, of how to set boundaries, of what the boundaries are? He read it from the scripture, right? And he made a careful investigation from the scripture as well as talking to people. And from those who were eyewitnesses, we are told, Luke says, from those who were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord. So he gathered uh, accounts, he gathered information, both from the scripture as well as from eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So we can study and follow testimony of faith warriors. And then why did he do that? What is your motivation when you do that? Where are you coming from? Is it just to exert your authority as parents? Is it to make sure that your children don't do things that uh, make you feel awkward and dishonored? Or is it something else? So Luke does it because he wanted to give an orderly account of those to those. To, uh, Luke says he wanted to give an orderly account to the most excellent Theophilus. We do not know who Theophilus is. But 
the word theophilus in greek means a friend of god or beloved by god so the reason why we do this the reason why we make a careful investigation to figure out what real boundaries are where they are whom we talk to the books we read the scripture we read is so that we can orderly account by which we can live and by which we can give it to those we care for and uh, and i'm talking about our children here right so just leave you with that and the closing thought is god's boundaries are given out of love if you see a boundary it means and your heart tells you that there's a boundary here it means you're prompted by god's love and the next study just leave you with that thought the next study will be from judges chapter 17 uh 20th september 17 18 19 20 21 very difficult parts of judges so do read it uh does not make very comfortable reading so we will really have to really look to god to see what the message is in those portions thank you sushil yeah uh, you were saying about that proverbs verse i think the proverbs verse 22 verse 16 chapter 22 verse 16 Train up a child in the way yeah, he should train go. Up. That's and right. Train up. I just go. go it, he will not depart from it. That's true. Train up a child in the way he should go, and he shall not depart from it. True. In a way, it shall not depart from him either. Is what I was trying to say. And uh, also, Sushil, uh, one thought that came from our discussion. Are you able to hear me or yes yes go uh, ahead please yeah yeah i think that was also uh, when we were discussing about boundaries i think the the thought that came from sujitol was that uh, one is the boundaries god helps us recognize boundaries but uh, also the center uh, when we move towards we focus on the center then that also helps us uh, identify or discern the boundaries so if god becomes the hub of everything uh, rather than god becoming one of the uh, spokes uh, then we will be we will be uh, focusing more in the sense we walk with focus on the hub which is god at the center that helps us discern the boundaries better that was another thought that came in in our discussion true mm-hmm. any other thoughts because the open discussion and a lot of good thoughts come out sometimes and i'm sorry i did not call call for that <laughs>